Cocaine is an ideal dental anesthetic because not only does it help numb the area, it has a property where it constricts the blood vessels. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. I first gave AG1 a try because I've been feeling sluggish and ugh. If there's one product that I'd have to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome them as a new partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash Rebecca. That's drinkag1.com slash Rebecca. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Therapy can give you the self-awareness that you need to build a social life that's the perfect size for you. And if you're thinking about starting to talk to a professional, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash W-Y-B to get 10% off on your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash W-Y-B. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Well, hi guys, this is my new friend, Brad. Some Hello. of you may know him as Scumbag Dad. Literally, when Kara said you have to meet Scumbag Dad, I was I did double take like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, the name the name is definitely off putting, yeah. and I know I'm gonna have to change it eventually because Why? the amount of opportunities I miss out on just because like the brand just sees the name is is countless. That is so and funny. My my poor agent, he always has to go through all this work to be like, no, the name's ironic. He's actually a good dad. He's actually got a job. Like. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I started Scumbag Dad as a way to make fun of the wholesome dads of TikTok. Yeah. And and my first big series was called Scumbag Dad, where I was, you know, pretended to be a good dad, but he's actually a criminal. <laughs> and so like the name is sort of stuck. But now at this level that I'm at, I'm experiencing like a lot of roadblocks because people who don't know me, they hear the name and, and they're like, like, oh you know, like like let's say you're Hilton and you're gonna sponsor you know, uh, an influencer to do a new video at a new hotel. Who are you going to pick? You know, Joe Travels, you know, Renee's Dance Blog, or Scumbag Dad? <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat, Scumbag Dad is off the table, even though I'll, I'll put together good work, and even though, you know, I've got a good really follower like base. It really is, like, good content, too. Like, it's not like you're not an actual jerk. Yeah, 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 but, but it takes a, a lot of people don't really take the time to see past that That's and I'm so starting funny. to hit that brick wall at this point in my like sort of influencer career where I'm like oh another you know my agent's <laughs> like yeah they passed I'm like did they even look at the content he's like no, no. it's mm -hmm. just they don't want to be associated with scumbag dad and in fact I almost got booked for a commercial like a like a real commercial for oh, a company so cool. and then uh like one of the people organizing it wanted me to audition. I got a call back for the first time in my life. And then, you know, somebody told me that, like, we had to pass because you failed our safety check. Like, you're not brand safe enough. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, I've already, I've, you know, I would have done a good job. The The commercial yeah. was right up my alley because it was, like, heavily inspired by my content anyways. And they told me that they're like, yeah, well, you know, it's not going to work out. And so oh, th that kind so of thing upsetting. is, that kind of thing has happened a couple times over the past year. I'm not, I'm not going to change the name until uh, I ha release a watch. Like okay. I've designed a watch that will be released later this year that says scumbag on the band. And I'm not going to abandon that. the name. Like I love watches. And, you know, my wife and I designed a watch that sort of like was my conception. Right, right. And I want to keep the name at least until we start selling that watch because I don't want to change my name like Brad Padre jokes. And then I'm now releasing a watch that says scumbag on it. Like that's, <laughs> it's just kind of random. Yeah, like, it's just a little too like silly. Like the people who aren't going to take the time to realize that you're just like a regular dude, like, and it's a parody, like yeah. it's satire, are not going to take the time to put the connection together. Correct, correct. But but when I do make, I, I think I might call myself like brand safe dad just to be a real <laughs> <laughs> and be like, oh, well, do you guys want to sponsor Brand Safe Dad? His name is Brand Safe Dad. <laughs> They'll be like, let's give this man $40,000. 100%. You know, just because will. his name sounds amazing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because, like, 
people who watch your content, like, you're so funny online. And it's all so many, it's like, satire and skits and, like, prank mm-hmm. things. But, like, your everyday job, like, you're still an orthodontist. Yeah, my everyday job, I'm extremely serious. You know, I, I don't do any jokes at work. I take my job extremely seriously. My patients have no idea. Uh, or, I mean, they have no I'm sorry, idea? They do, they do now. Once I started, <laughs> Once I started getting a lot more followers, patients would recognize me. A lot of new patients would recognize me. Some would take pictures and like, I'm cool with that. But my persona in the office is 100% not my online persona. That's I, so funny. I take my work in the office very, That's very good, seriously. That's good though. Like as you should. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to mess with somebody's health be, you yeah. know, just because I'm making, just because I'm roasting people online. <laughs> Love that. So, like, what made you want to become an orthodontist? Like, how did how I did mean, you get there? I, I wanted to be an orthodontist because I've got a lot of you know. I wanted. I, I initially wanted to be a heart surgeon. Really? When I was an undergrad, and then That's I sort hard. of. I think I, I. To be honest, I, I, I pivoted a little bit because I felt like I felt like orthodontics was you know a more consistent lifestyle. I, I felt like even if I'm horrible at it, I'm never going to kill anybody, you know. And that it sort of like evolved from there. So. You know, I wasn't as serious an artist throughout my life. Like, I always did music and stuff throughout high school and college, but I never really experienced anything resembling big success. Right. You know, I was on America's Got Talent like 13 years ago, but they just kicked us off with our, like, stupid little pirate rap group. Really? I was in a pirate rap group. I did music with my friends, and that rap group, you know, is called Captain Dan and the Scurvy Crew. Uh My, My best friend is named Dan. And, like, we were invited on to America's Got Talent. And we were invited on as one of these, like, joke bands that was going to get kicked off. But since we got kicked off so quick, it it stirred in like some sense of revenge. And so I tried to go for MasterChef the next year and I made top 100 on MasterChef. And then they told me to kick rocks because my story sucked. Like I wasn't a very sympathetic character. You know, they asked me, they said, do you want to quit your jobs in orthodontist to be a chef? And I'm like, no. (laughs) You know, I'm there in Burbank, you know, with fake fake fruit behind me with a camera running. And they're like, uh, how long have you been cooking for? And I'm like, July. <laughs> because cause the only reason I was even going on the show was some sort of weird revenge for America's Got Talent. Yeah. And the only reason they pulled me on was because at the time I was writing these like dumb rap songs about food. And I had this like little goofy, nerdy musical background. And I think that's why they like sort of fast tracked me to Burbank. But then they kicked me and like, you know, 70 other people out. And then ever since then, like I did a bunch of serious music projects that never went anywhere. And when I started TikTok, I thought it would just be a way to promote a couple of YouTube videos I'd made. But right. at the time, I wasn't making any money off this. I wasn't considering it a serious, you know, career move. It was just fun with my friends. Yeah. That's all it was. And and when it's just fun with your friends, you don't really care about failure. Right, exactly. There's no, exactly. There's no pressure. All my bills are paid through there's my no real expectations. job. And yeah, and but then once I started to take off on TikTok, like it did change the dynamic of how I view my work. I started to take more time off uh, from the office as time went on. And now I still work, but only about a week a month. Got and it. as long as I, you know, I keep one foot in the office because it's very stupid to abandon my career that I've had for a long time just yeah. because I want to post on the internet. You know, I, I feel like a lot of people, they get a little bit of clout and they quit their awesome corporate job and they move to L.A. And, you know, some some of them succeed very well, but some of them do not. Yeah. Some of them have their sort of arc. They do well and then things fall apart or they, they don't they don't get any better. And they're still exactly. like they're no they're no closer to retirement than they were when they quit their job. Exactly. And, you know, I haven't seen anybody sort of regret their time, but I will say that I don't want to make, like, dumb financial moves. Exactly, yes. Uh, especially considering I've got a kid and a yeah. wife, and I don't want my son to, like, experience hardships because daddy wanted to be a poster. On the internet, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. And, like, it, it's so interesting because, like, I came – I was a public school teacher. Mm-hmm. I was a high school social studies teacher. That's fun. And it was – interesting i loved parts of it so much Mm -hmm. and other parts i'm like now that it's one of those things where in the moment like while you're in it you're like oh this is bad but i can power through for the kids but then like once you remove yourself you're like wow that was really messed up that they made us do all of that holy moly like i can't believe i stuck with it that long yeah it can get tough and so it for like it's so funny because what you're saying is so valid (laughs) 
at the same time, it doesn't take that much to make more than a school teacher. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> Like, this is a very low bar. Yeah, school teachers are classically underpaid. Right. So so I can very much understand someone <laughs> abandoning a school job for Right, but I would never, like, a, co- a corporate job I feel like would be a little different. Like, when you're making, like, you know, you got a 401k, you got, like, the retirement and stuff. That's true. Corporate jobs are different, but also corporate jobs have a disadvantage wherein if you go into, like, comedy or you make a bunch of offensive content, you may be persona non grata if you'd ever decide to come back you right. know because because a lot of corporations like even though you may be special at one point right uh you're sort of easily replaceable they can exactly. they can bring in another executive mm-hmm. project manager anytime mm-hmm. that doesn't have a history of offensive rap songs you know what i yes. mean like so so a lot of people who have abandoned their corporate jobs depending on who they are they might have closed that door off completely and, you know, best of luck to them. I just didn't want to be in that pool. I wanted No, to, I understand that and, completely. Yeah, especially because I, I shit on people all the time. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I could get canceled or banned right. almost any time because I've chosen a route of comedy that is arguably not, you know, supported it's, by the platforms. I understand that. I understand yeah. that. And, like, again... It's not like you're leaving your job. Like you're still there. You're still around. Like and mm-hmm. you're you're professional as you do your job. Like you're professional where you need to be. Yeah, I and don't. I think the only thing that would change if I had to go back is I'd have to cut my hair because I think I'm the only orthodontist at the conference with a mullet. Pretty ponytail. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, so I'd, what? I'd probably go back to clean cut if okay. I started to do that full time again. But do you but think but you ever will. I, it sort of depends on the situation. You know, you life that? is fluctuant. Uh, you know, I may enjoy my time out here for a little while. But, you know, there are pressures involved in content creation that are not there in the doctor life. And I will say that I work more inconsistent hours Mm -hmm. now than I did, you know, when I was full time at the office. You know, full time at the office is good because my my schedule's there. You know, the amount of money I'm making is consistent. I'm not I'm doing my work that I know I'm good at and nobody can say like He's bad at that. Whereas yeah. whereas content creation, you know, if I hit on a couple of jokes one month, my earnings go through the roof. But if I'm if those jokes flop, sometimes I'm not able to explain why a high effort video tanks. You know, it happens all the time. Absolutely. Where I where I put together a piece of work that I say, this is awesome. I say, this is awesome. This is going to kill as soon as I upload it. I don't need to upload for two weeks because it's going to kill so much. And the amount of times that I do that. And it tanks yeah. is countless. Yeah. And so I can never really truly rely 100% on this income because I can never correlate my effort level and my hours with a certain amount of money earned. That makes sense. I get that. Yeah. And something – so I, I asked a lot of my followers, like, hey, what are some questions that you have about orthodontics or, like, any any stories or anything like that? And I'm ready. One, the most asked question is – what exactly is the difference between an orthodontist and a dentist? Like, what does an orthodontist specialize in? So an orthodontist specializes basically in movement of the teeth okay. throughout, you know, life. We know how to treat, you know, a young person who's prepubescent and sort of arranging their mouth so that the teeth come in a lot better. We're capable of moving teeth into better positions, uh, you know, in adolescents and young adults. Uh, The difference is that dentists tend to focus more on hygiene and restoring cavities, you know, replacing missing teeth, those types of things, Uh, you know, creating dentures. So dentists take care of problems that have technically happened to damage your smile and your bite. Whereas orthodontists, we address issues with tooth position primarily. Okay. And okay. so, yeah, we, we almost always stick to bra- things like braces or Invisalign. And we do work with dentists, you know, to open up space right. or close space to, like, make a situation easier. But the short answer to your question is that we specialize in braces and moving teeth into different positions. Okay. So how would someone, like, if someone wanted to become an orthodontist, yeah. what kind of educational path would they have to take 
to make that happen. So in order to become an orthodontist, at least in the United States, you need to go through four years of undergrad, mm-hmm. and then you need to go into dental school. Do you and have then, to major in any? Sorry, do you uh, have to major in anything specific? Yes, uh, a lot of dental schools have specific requirements, okay. such as like biology, biochemistry. You know, you need all the standard doctory things, and then you need to take an entrance exam known as the DAT, which you know has probably changed a lot since I you know went to school. But you need to take a, an exam, which is a lot like the SAT, which sort of Puts you in the running to compete at different schools. And once you pass, once you get a score on that, you get accepted to a dental school. You go through four years of dental school and then you get accepted into a specialty program, which is between usually between two and three years of specialty training. And then you graduate with a dental license. You know, I'm sorry, you graduate with a dental diploma, which then you can use to get licensed in a different state. And then you are also able to adver- ad- you are also able to advertise yourself as a specialist. Okay. So if I just go through dental school, I can't advertise myself as an orthodontist. I can do braces. A dentist can legally do braces anywhere, and some dentists can do it very, very well. But they can't advertise themselves as orthodontists. Interesting. Okay. You know, so okay. so the the term dentist is a catch all for anybody who's successfully gone through dental school and passed the required criteria. Whereas the specialties such as oral surgery, periodontics, uh, endodontics, and orthodontics, these all indicate that this is a dentist who's gone through all of the required dental training, who has also passed an additional set of lessons to specialize in something. Like endodontists, for instance, only do, I'm sorry, endodontists, for instance, specialize in root canal. So if your root, if the root of the tooth is gone, or infected, then they are able to fix that with arguably more uh, training than a typical dentist. Wow. Okay. Mm. Okay. That makes sense. Interesting. I never knew that, like, it was all under the same, like, dental diploma kind of thing. Okay, that's so interesting. Correct. Yeah, it's all under the same. We all have the same sort of state requirements as far as continuing education goes, but we just have different things that we're allowed to tell the public we are. That's so interesting. You know but you I mean? can still all do it. No, you we, just can't tell the public you can correct, do it. Correct, correct. You, you can. That's well, so you, uh, funny. Sorry, you, it's not so much. You can tell the public. As a dentist, you can tell the public you do braces. You just can't call, your, you just can't call yourself an orthodontist. Okay. You know what I mean? You can be a dentist who does gum surgeries. You're legally allowed to be a regular dentist and take out wisdom teeth. But you can't call yourself an oral surgeon. Oral surgeons go through more training. They learn anesthesia. They They have the ability to sort of tell the public that they have this additional training so you know we're more we're more likely to do this procedure in the office got it i'm not trying to giggle at the information my That's husband fine. just got his wisdom teeth out yeah and every time every time someone brings up wisdom teeth i think back to him <laughs> it was a fun time so um my husband i think i've told the story before but it's okay i'll tell it again do it again um i First of all, we are both terrified of needles, okay. like absolutely terrified. Um, and so when he had to get his wisdom teeth out, like he literally went up to the girl at the desk the morning of his procedure and was like, hey, is there any way that like you guys can knock me out that doesn't have anything to do with an IV or a shot or anything? Like I'll take anything. And she was like, no, we don't offer. He goes, well, I, I did see online that there are some places that have. And she's like, my guy, we don't have anything and he was like okay sorry i didn't mean i didn't want to be like disrespectful i just had to ask because this man is terrified was he looking for hypnosis i don't really know what he had in mind or like a drug like probably like, takes a pill he wouldn't he also like he wouldn't even take the narcotics that they gave him for pain because yeah. he's like he's he won't he won't do that um so they like they got him obviously in the little room and i was sitting with him until they put him under um, and he was sitting there practicing his breathing. Yeah, that for... makes sense. <laughs> um, it is stressful. It it was so stressful. But the thing is, um, so his mom passed a few years ago, and mm-hmm. the last time I had been in a hospital mm. was when she passed, and that was a very mm. traumatic incident. So all of a sudden, I look up from my phone. And I see my husband strapped into this bed yeah. with wires and whatever, and I start just panicking and i like i'm trying i'm like rebecca don't make this about you you're not you're not the important person here today stop making this about you and as he's like deep breathing and getting the iv i'm sitting there in the background like slowly 
blacking out and all of a sudden i hear the one of the hygienists or the nurse um i don't know what their titles were actually uh, i mean depending on the situation it's probably just like surgical assistants surgical assistants yeah. um she, all of a sudden she goes are you good and i i thought she was talking to avery but she was not mm. she goes to her radio she goes we got a wife that is not good back here. Can mm. someone bring like some chips Boy. or something? Yeah, because your blood pressure <laughs> sinks. They need to give you like sugar or something. And so any to any time someone brings up wisdom teeth, I just kind of cringe a little bit because I think back to how weak I. <laughs> In my defense, I had a little bit of PTSD for a moment, sure. but I get it. It, it is tough. <laughs> first gave AG1 a try because I've been feeling sluggish and ugh. But since drinking AG1, I feel like I have so much energy to get all the things I need done during the day. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs, like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because it's formulated based on the latest science and maintains super high quality standards. Even my husband started taking AG1 and he's always telling me how energized he feels now. I've added AG1 to my morning routine and it just makes me feel ready to take on the day. If there's one product that I'd have to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome them as a new partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash Rebecca. That's drinkag1.com slash Rebecca. Check it out. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Have you checked in with your social battery lately? How is it? Are you bursting with energy or are you feeling a little drained? If you're not feeling your best, don't stress. It's normal to be a little less social in the winter. Additionally, therapy can give you the self-awareness that you need to build a social life that's the perfect size for you. I say in a lot of my content that therapy is a good thing. Everyone can benefit from it. I've even benefited from therapy. And if you're thinking about starting to talk to a professional, why not give BetterHelp a try? It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash W-Y-B to get 10% off on your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash W-Y-B. Now, back to the episode. Removing wisdom teeth is very difficult. Have you ever, like, are you, do you specialize in, like, you obviously specialize in mm. braces because you're an orthodontist, but have you ever tried to do any of the other things? Well, in dental school, they... In dental school, they have you go through all these different rotations through the clinic. So uh -huh. any dentist who graduates does a certain number of wisdom teeth, does right. a certain number of, Interesting. of root canals. You know, so we all learn it. It's not to say we do it to be – like we're not all amazing no, at it when we right. graduate because there's only a limited amount of time it's in like school. like nursing rotations. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we never – like, because we weren't oral surgeons, we couldn't drill the bone. But right. we've gone sort of like we will work in situations to remove very difficult wisdom teeth. And that gives us the experience and understanding of how difficult it is for the oral surgeons right. to do their work. Interesting. That's so fascinating. Like, my mind is kind of blowing right now because I've never even, like, thought about how that might yeah. all work. And the thing is that a lot of dentists, like, once they graduate, they choose – sort of not to, you know, sort of choose to refer out certain procedures because removing impacted wisdom teeth is so challenging that even though a dentist can legally do it, they, they might not may not to. be comfortable for it. And that's why the field of oral surgery exists because some of these things are so complicated and so sensitive that if you don't have a lot of experience with it, like you run the risk of doing damage. That makes – it's so funny that you're explaining it in this way because it made some of the stories that people have sent me make more sense. Got it. Because, like, this one that I'm about to tell, like, I, I read it and I'm like, I do not – I it just didn't make sense to me because I didn't realize that they had the same kind of dental sure. training. Sure. So someone sent me a story about how they had a, a an adolescent who had braces mm -hmm. and it was finally time to get – it was more of like a, an older teenager was finally sure. getting their braces off. Got it. So they go, and I, I don't know the exact process. You know better than me. Sure. But when they, like, pull off the 
brackets. The, yeah. the brackets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a, you, you really have to yank them off the teeth. Yeah, I mean, they can be a little. Right. It can be a little painful to remove them. Yes. Well, what this orthodontist realized that it looked like as they were trying to remove the bracket mm-hmm. that the tooth was kind of cracking underneath. Yes. And they kind of. They said that it cracked in a way that it was not supposed to be cracking. Mm -hmm. So they had to get the dentist involved and they had to figure out what was going on. What ended up happening was um, this kid's childhood dentist did not fill a cavity correctly. Mm -hmm. And so they filled the cavity to what they thought was completion, packed it, sealed it, called it a day, but it wasn't all gone. So Mm -hmm. it started growing and festering under that sealant layer and just was basically hollowing the tooth out from the inside. Mm -hmm. So then when this kid got braces and the pressure of removing the brackets was just moving against this hollowed out tooth on the inside, it just kind of shattered it. Yeah, that's that's extremely rare. Right. Um, It it has happened. I would hope so. (laughs) It has happened. You know, like if there's decay underneath a filling, it can... It can eat away the tooth without knowing, you know, regular maintenance, you know, regular dental visits. They take, you know, they tend to take x-rays that can identify this before it's a problem. Um, But, you know, uh, it's tough to comment on that because I'm I'm not familiar with the case. No, that's okay. No, yeah, Uh, absolutely. But I I will say that that's extremely rare. Oh, yeah, Yeah. 100%. And I will say that in cases where I've removed braces and like chunks of teeth have come off, it's almost always been hygiene related. Like someone who gets their braces on, then moves away for two years and doesn't call us and doesn't floss. And then oh. they have all this decay. So you and had chunks of two I've had, teeth? I've had that. And it's very rare. But I have had situations where it, it's most – the most common time that happens is when, when, a, when a family who's maybe a little bit lax with their hygiene – you know, disappears. Right. And it's very rare. You know, we'll send them letters. We'll be like, could you please come in? And then if they've moved and don't tell us, we don't, what are we supposed we have no to do? Idea. Right. So then what will happen is they'll show up two, three years later. You know, maybe they moved in with a different family member. And the state insurance, like Medicaid is very good in a lot of states. Right. But one disadvantage with Medicaid is that it requires a pre-authorization process. Okay. So if you are, if you require, you know, if you meet the state's requirements, if you're low income, you can essentially get free braces, but the teeth have to be really bad. Okay. So you have to pass a certain set of criteria. And like a lot of my patients are under this insurance. But if you move states, you're not getting any help. If you if you walk into a dental office in state A and you go to state B to try and get treatment, state A is not going to give state B any of the requisite money. Right. And even if they do, even if they give the new orthodontist anything, it's going to be a laughable sum. Wow. Like every state – I'm not saying they're working against the patient, but if you want to – you know, how else are they supposed to do it? Sometimes people move two, three times. What, are they supposed to pay the new guy a full case fee every time? And the case fees are so low, the question is how much do you take away from the first guy? And it's a really sort of interesting problem when people move states under state insurance that – you know, like the new state's not going to help you because from that state's perspective, you're You've a kid who's helped. already got braces. Right. You know what I mean? It's not that new state's responsibility to finish it off. So when they do their paperwork, they're going to offer the new guy like 80 bucks to finish a case wow. no matter where it is. And that orthodontist, like, you know, I mean, they can take it if they want, but it's just, you know, it's not a good way to – I hate to say it, it's not a great way to run an office right. under the state insurance system. If you are, have state insurance and you get braces, you should st- your best bet to have it finished properly is to stay within that state. Because once you move, you're going to have incredible difficulty getting a new orthodontist to take the case. And when people transfer, I tell them straight up, I'm like, you can like go ahead, please. You know, if you if you need to move states, please get treatment there. But if you know you can't afford it, you should let me take these braces off. Yeah. Please let me take them off. Because if I do, and you roll into another office and your, your kid's teeth, like, if they start to shift back and they start to look more crooked, you have more of a chance of that right. new state covering it. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. Because you walk into that state with, you know, an kind of okay, you know, still a crooked, couple crooked teeth, right, but right. an okay smile, they're going to reject you. So some people take that deal. Like, I'm like, you know, I won't charge, we won't charge, we can't charge you any money. We'll just right. take off the braces because this is what's best for you. But some people want to think 
that I don't know what I'm talking about. They right. want to fight the system. They're like, oh, no, well, I'll do this and this. And they always fail. And sometimes they think I'm trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Oh, my god! Like, it's happened, like, once or twice where they're like, you know, they think I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like they'll they'll sort of like write a letter like to the state and be like Dr. Padre didn't okay, finish the case. Okay, tell me that story. Tell me that story. Um well I mean it's it, the story's not very dramatic, but no, it's okay. like, you know, a family started their orthodontic treatment uh-huh. and they moved and they same thing. I, they said they were going to move states and I was like, "Look, you're not going to find anybody to take this case." Right. You know what, when you get to that state, you know, you're probably going to have to pay for it. You right. know, because once they see you've got the braces on already, Insurance you know, won't cover insurance it. isn't going to cover anything, and so they ended up they ended up moving. Uh-huh. They ended up you know going to different offices who wouldn't accept their insurance. They ended up trying to get it covered by the state insurance, which they got rejected. And then they wrote like a letter to the board. To like, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. Then they wrote a letter to the insurance, complaining that I left them with an unfinished case and that we should refund what they've already been paid. Here's the fun part: is we did refund it. Because it wasn't <laughs> worth it wasn't worth it wasn't worth fighting. So we refunded the full case fee, and none of that money went to the new the new state. The family still had to pay for it. So all they sort of did was, you know, like they didn't they didn't earn themselves anything. Like the the state had paid us a certain amount to start the case, and when they sort of filed that, we explained to the state we're like, well, you know, they moved. We'll refund the money, and then when we did like a follow up, we're like, so what happened? They're like, yeah, well, because the kid already had braces on. They weren't going to, like, because no, I already fixed up most of the case. The new state wasn't going to help. And it made me kind of sad because it made me feel like they just, they thought I was trying to rip them off. Yeah. Because I told them straight up, like, just pay the new state. So they went through the rigmarole of, like, pretending that I didn't tell them that or something. <laughs> and then even though we refunded the state the money, none of that money transferred states, which is exactly what I know is going to happen. And so... You know, they it, just made a hassle for no reason. It's well, the, the reason the reason was because they wanted it to be covered in the new state, right. and in their heads, they thought Doctor Padre's lying. They thought if we can get them, if we can get Doctor Padre's office to refund the state, then surely that means we'll be covered in the new state. Mm-mm. But bear in mind, I had already done work on the patient. The patient's smile was better than it was when we started. Mm-hmm. And bear in mind, these insurances only cover you if you look bad. They reject seven out of 10 patients. We have to see a lot of new patients in order to start people because so many get rejected. Wow. And so that's the problem is if I've started you and I've been working on you for six, eight months, your smile's a little, it's going to be better. And you may not meet the requirements of the new state. Whereas when I started, your teeth were super messy and the state of Iowa decided to cover it. But now that you're in this new place, they look at the new records and they're like, yeah, this kid's bad, but he's like not as bad as these other kids. Because when you... When you're under state insurance, you're in competition with all the other kids right. sent in that month. Right. Like there are measurements. There's something called the Salzman Index that we use to like measure how crooked teeth are. But at the end of the day, you know, n- none of this is official. But at the end of the day, I feel like certain months they're harder than others because there's m- there's a lot more people seeking treatment and they have to pick and choose. Yeah. Who are they? The state has a tough responsibility. They've got 100 kids, all who have gnarly teeth. Who's the one who deserves, I mean, deserves, who's the one who gets paid for? They have to pick the ones who need like fancy surgeries or extractions. They can't just pick the kid with like a couple crooked teeth. Yeah. They have to make a difficult choice. And the advantage of that is that the kids who are the most in need receive the treatment. But the disadvantage is that, you know, it's, cre- it's, it's created like a system where if someone changes states, they're, they're basically not going to get any they're help. They're out of luck. Oh, yeah. that's so sad. And, like, I, I say this just about every episode, mm-hmm. that when it comes to, like, crazy situations, like, if people do experience them at work, they're definitely rare. They don't happen every day. Like, most interactions that you have with patients that I would have with students and parents are very neutral. Like, 90% yeah. of all of them are very neutral. And then mm-hmm. you get maybe... Five percent that are like, oh, that patient or that student made me feel really nice. Like I, I loved them. They were or their parent complimented yeah. me or something. And it's those five percent, like those crazy, rare, like, what are you doing? Situations yeah. that like they're far and few between, mm-hmm. but they really can make working so much more difficult. Yeah. And they also can attribute to so many stereotypes about 
professions. Correct, correct. It's, yes. It's, it's those very rare situations where mm-hmm. people misinterpret the work or don't fully understand it where they start to develop – you know, negative feelings, and then they sort yes. of like maybe post about them online, exactly. write reviews, and then then you know like one or two sort of like vocal people who may not who might not have understood what right. went on are now sort of like in an echo chamber with more people reading it, and they're right. wondering like, well, did this happen to me? Is my exactly. orthodontist going to do that to me? And you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, like nobody in the profession is. You know, ever seeking right. to like trick any of our exactly. patients. Exactly, exactly. Um, but that doesn't stop people from pontificating theories and not understanding like the diversity of cases. You know, I can't tell you how many people have like come to me just in like my social life and asked me if, you know, uh, Smile Direct Club could fix their bite. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Smile Direct Club, you know, is, is now a defunct company, right. but like they made sort of home home, you know, Retainer home align- aligners. Yeah. They basically basically Invisalign without a doctor. And you know, there was like a critical misunderstanding of like what made a difficult case. A doctor should explain whether or not you are an easy enough case to be treated with, you know, home aligners because the bite is a very complicated thing. Relapse, like teeth shifting back after braces, is a very complicated thing. And if you're only given part of the story, it's very easy to in- misinterpret what happens. Right. You know what I mean? Like... Uh, you know, uh, I, I can't think of any examples off the bat, but That's I okay. probably could. Where... I can give you one while well, you think about it oh, if you want. Go ahead. Or, well, you got a question about a specific scenario? It wasn't necessarily about a specific scenario, more about like, I, I just have another story if you need a second to think about like mm, this is... a parent trying no, to. When did, you made a post that's like, I'm going to ask an orthodontist questions. Yeah. And it wasn't, I'm going to ask scumbag dad questions. <laughs> I did. I know. Oh. I should have. I was just curious. No, that's okay. Got it. I, in in my head, originally, like, when I was scheduling the episode, I was thinking, like, jobs, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. jobs. No, I didn't that's fair play. think about no, I want, the I other. want I want the duality because okay. I feel like it's very interesting. I feel yeah. like there are a couple orthodontists on TikTok and on YouTube who are, like, you know, fairly successful, but they, they really stick to teeth. And, yes. and that's fair. I am, I don't know, maybe I just have a weird you know, weird no, thing in my brain, but I, I, I don't want to carve out my, you know, online and artistic persona around Absolutely. the tooth stuff. I feel like the other guys have it covered. I totally get that. I'm trying to show that like, you know, orthodontists and dentists, like you can still be professional and, and so have fun. a diverse life outside Absolutely. of that. And so I'm Maybe we can do it. a whole second episode mm. another time hey, on Scumbag Dad. If this is a hit, Let's do Ooh, it. Yeah. I'll be back in June. All right, cool. Yeah. I'll actually give you notice this time. Sure. <laughs> this is perfect. Well, th- th- thinking back to, like, other people who, like, may or may not have all the information who, like, again, it's rare when it happens, but these people really make the job that much more difficult mm. or tend to, like, more difficult stereotypes. Someone sent me a story about how. For whatever reason, even though they, in their office, told this family over and over and over again, here are your teeth cleaning instructions, Mm -hmm. here are products that we recommend you using, Mm -hmm. here are the different kinds of teeth cleaning tools that we think you should use, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, this parent and child were under the impression that when you have braces, you don't have to brush your teeth. That's not good. You don't have to do that. It's fine. Um, Every single tooth in that child's mouth ended up rotting. And so not only did the mom pay out of pocket for the orthodontist, for the braces, they ended up having to cut the braces short, pulled every tooth, and this kid at 16 ended up needing a full set of dentures. That, I've never seen that. Um, Oh, I would hope not. I would hope not. (laughs) Uh, There are horror stories of that Oh yeah, again, they're Um, very few and far between. They're yeah. horror stories for a reason. Yeah. I hope that's not a common thing. It's never been that bad. Like, I have had patients with, like, severe decay. And like I said before, mostly that's folks who bail on the office for a while. Right. But if they're coming in regularly and I'm identifying decay, I'll usually give the patient a couple of visits before I request. Right. I'll give them a couple of visits before I advise that the braces be removed. And it's always a tough conversation. Right. I'll always take the parent back into a consultation room and I'll say, look, I, I hate, I, I don't have anything against your kid, but I do think that the braces should be removed because the, because they're not brushing and flossing. 
And some people take it and they understand and they're able to correct it, but some are not. They'll tell me, you know, hey, well, he's he's 13. He's got a mind of his own. Hey, I've got, you know, I've got other things to deal with. It's just so stressful. And like, I get that. But the enemy here is the bacteria in your child's mouth. Right. It's not you. Between all three of us, like, you know, whatever issues you're having with the hygiene, Explaining them to me, like, isn't, fixing isn't it. really going to fix it. And explaining it to the bacteria isn't really going to fix it. You, you just need to do the work. And and if your kid isn't going to floss properly, like, odds of them wearing the retainers is low. Right. So now, you're, now you see one other fun little secret about orthodontics is when the teeth are very clean, the result tends to be more stable. You know, when you get gingivitis, when you get, you know, red puffy gum tissue because your flossing is poor, it... It creates a less stable orthodontic result, you know, because the gum tissue is unhealthy. It doesn't quite heal the same way. And when you're real young, you know, like 11, 12, and they finish braces, it's not that big a deal. But it becomes a much bigger deal the older a patient is. Mm -hmm. Like younger people, you know, 8, 9, 10, when they – if they fail to floss their teeth, it's not like that critical. For some reason – for some reason, the saliva of younger people just is like generally more antibacterial. Whereas once you get older, once you get puberty, odds of cavities become a lot higher while you've got the braces on. And so it increases the older you are when you're treated. You know, anecdotally, I'll say that the older the a patient is, the less stable the result is. And the poorer a patient's hygiene is throughout treatment the less stable the result is. So you have, if you have a 17-year-old with bad hygiene, I mean, the teeth are going to look real good when it's done, but if they don't wear their retainers really well, the teeth are going to shift back. Whereas a 10-year-old with you know, some hygiene issues is more likely to have a stable result long-term because they're still growing. Their bodies sort of adapt to the new tooth positions, whereas older folks and adults, you put the teeth into new positions, but the body never fully, ad- the gum it tissue, never accepts it. yeah, the, the gum tissue never fully adapts, especially in challenging cases. Like when you've got an impacted canine, an impacted canine is what happens when a, you know, your canine tooth or your eye tooth is stuck really close to the nose in the bone. Oh. And when you bring those teeth down in older folks and like more developed teenagers, even though they look pretty good, like the gum tissue is ne- never perfect and the tooth can relapse. It can go high even if you wear your retainers. And then when that happens, I just recommend the kid get a crown. Just because if they keep getting braces, it'll pull down, go up, pull down, go up, pull down, go up. But I do a lot of impacted canines. You know? No, so I don't I, I don't know if this would – I, I didn't have an impacted canine. I mm. ended up having a um, – when I was very young, I had a cyst in my gum. They Ooh. said it was the size of a golf ball. Yeah, that so happens. What they had to do is, I th- how old was I? I might have been like ten. Mm. They had to go in, take it out, take out all of my adult teeth that were in there. You just kind of adjust. Well, I just realized I've been sort of hunching. I no, feel it's like okay. I saw that my head was the top of that camera, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like crouching a little you're bit. Okay. And it's, it's honestly getting to. You're me. fine. But they go had ahead. no. You're fine. You're fine. Cyst gums. They they ended up taking out all of my adult teeth cleaning them and then like putting them back in is all what they, of them no, not all of them like the ones that were around the cyst oh that's fair but i never understood how you could like uh, a young, take out a, yeah young people put, that's crazy yeah if you're if you're young enough you can have a tooth literally removed and then if it's implanted put back in a reasonable amount of time and the tooth is cared for it can the body can re-accept it that's crazy to yeah me. that's it's cool that's cool. But it's basically exclusively for younger people. Okay. So, like, that makes sense because, like, there's a lot of people that, like, once they're older and they get hit in the face and they lose a tooth, they just have to get a fake tooth. Yeah, correct, correct. They'll need to get a denture or an implant. What What age would you say that that, like, around what age would that cut off? I mean, everybody's different. But I would say once you're above around 14 years old, Interesting. I don't really think there's good odds that you can have a tooth extracted and then put back in successfully, um, or at least without complication. You know, everything, everybody's different. You know, there's right. miracle right. stories right. all the for time. Sure, for sure. But in general, if I have like a slightly more developed teenage patient who loses a tooth for any reason, that tooth is most likely going to need a root canal and a splint, you know, something to hold it in for a while. Okay. And then we sort of chance it. Like it might, it might stay and sometimes they do, but it's never quite as stable as when it's a younger person. 
Teeth are so fascinating. Yeah, teeth are crazy. No, like I I never even thought about teeth this much before. Now I'm so fascinated. People are going to watch this podcast and be like, oh, it's Scumbag Dad. I can't wait to hear him talk about (laughs) all the influencers he hates. Oh, I can't wait to hear him talk about watches or his next project. And I'm like, What influencers teeth do you hate? Oh, I don't hate anyone. <laughs> well, whose teeth do you hate? I don't hate anyone's teeth. I will teeth. say that's, I, I that's did, a mean thing to say. I don't know. I don't know. You're talking about influencers you hate. I did have braces. I did not wear my retainers. No, that's fair. Like a lot of people don't wear their retainers. But I should have. Philosophically, like as long as you're better off than you would have been without the braces, like it's still a Oh, victory. yeah. My teeth were so jacked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably would have qualified for that one yeah. program. Like I had... A tooth that was like half a centimeter towards my tongue, mm-hmm. like just not. It was bad. It was a bad time. Mm-hmm. But like people are doing crazy things with their like teeth and their jaws nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Oral surgery is a hell of a thing. You know, there's lots of crazy surgeries they can do. There's a lot of like really interesting implants and expanders that can be used in certain environments. Like, yeah, miracles can happen when it comes to dental work. I, one of my friends mm. um, wanted to expand his smile. Yeah. And at first when it was just a cosmetic thing, he was like, I don't need to do that. But then the doctor was like, no, well, that will actually help you sleep better because it will expand everything. Was it done as an adult? Yeah. It was done like a year ago. Did they do a surgery? They broke his jaw. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. They broke his jaw. He was awake for it. Yep. The yep. painkillers apparently were not pain yep. killing. That sounds about right. Um, mm-hmm. He said that it was like the moment they broke it, it broke him out of the days yeah. and that he felt everything. And so they asked him, like they saw his eyes go wide. They're like, can you feel that? And he's like, Ugh! <laughs> like yeah. I can't. Oh. Um, so then they put in a palate expander on the roof of his mouth. Yep. And every yep. day he had to Yep. Crank it a little wider mm-hmm. and a little wider yep. and a little wider. Yep. And then after doing that for what, six to eight months, mm-hmm. they gave him braces or a retainer or something mm-hmm. to just kind of shape everything back up. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it sounded like the most excruciating thing I've ever heard in my life. It is pretty hardcore. Uh, oh. What he probably had is called a SARP, a Surgically Assisted Rapid Palatal Expansion uh, yeah, it is exactly what you heard. Oh. Uh, they need to <laughs> they need to cut the upper jaw, the maxilla, uh, sort of down the middle, and attach a very complex expander to push it out. It's really the only way to do this reliably in an adult, like a young kid who's still growing. This can be done very effectively without the surgery, but an older person, like you really you really can't get that much movement with an expander unless you do the surgery. Oh so terrible like, ah. oh my god it just gives me ch- i don't it's, like pain it's challenging <laughs> but it does work if you're trying to achieve a certain medical goal that makes sense and I, again like i think the fact that he can now like sleep better and he doesn't yeah. snore like and, that's that it, might be worth it yeah and it know? does it, it, you know depending on the situation it can have benefits to the palate it can have benefits to reduce sleep apnea like you know everybody's different the way we sort of grew older and the way we all developed like if you have a narrow palate, it can cause issues later on in life. And he's probably very happy that he did it. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the moment, definitely was not. But now yeah. that it's over. Yeah. Now- the, the healing is rough. Sometimes they have to wire the jaw shut. It's maybe not with his case. But like no. in some cases where they do a lower jaw surgery, they need to wire the jaw shut for, you know, six to eight weeks. It's challenging. He, he was a really good sport about it because he also does content. So he mm-hmm. would do uh, like videos about like trying to kick a football into the gap tooth That's kind of funny. thing. Yeah. Like, he did a lot of early... And I'm like, sure he got, like, a big space between the front oh teeth. Oh, my yeah. God. You could fit a finger in there. Yeah, it's hardcore. Wild. Absolutely wild. He actually did a podcast episode with me. I think he did, like, the third episode. Mm-hmm. And the entire time, he was like, can I explain my lisp to the people? <laughs> no, good, good, uh, <laughs> said, good story. Yeah, yeah. But something else that you reminded me of, another... Everyone wants to know, because mm. apparently no one actually understands... Mm. Mm what gum disease and gingivitis really is. Uh, Gingivitis is simpler than you think. It's basically like when you get a mild infection in the gum tissue. Okay. Uh, Usually it's caused by poor hygiene. You know, food gets stuck underneath the gums. Bacteria starts to sort of feast on that food. Your body interprets that as a, you know, your body interprets that as an infection. Mm -hmm. So just like any infection, it sends blood to the area. It sends you know, antibodies. And so that's why the gum tissue begins to swell up and get red, just like a bruise, just like any sort of infection in the body. Um, that's 
the short answer. That's what gingivitis is. And gingivitis, when severe enough, uh, can start to degrade the bone that holds your teeth in place. And then it starts to become periodontitis, where the periodo- periodontitis is sort of defined by much more severe consequences to gingivitis, where the teeth can become unstable and, and you know, bad situations can be lost. Interesting. And so is yeah. gingivitis a kind of gum disease or is that something that's gingivitis, different? Gingivitis is gum disease. Okay. That's okay. Sort of like so they're the same thing. They're correct. interchangeable. Yeah. Okay. Well, well okay. gingivitis, when somebody says you've got gingivitis, that's like sort of easy to recover. Clean up your teeth, do a deep cleaning, whatever. Like it's going to, it's fi- It's easily right, fixable. Right, right. Okay. Whereas okay. once you say, once a doctor says you've got periodontitis, um, the situation is much more challenging, you know, okay. usually where... Now your teeth may be in a compromised position if you don't get more urgent care. And gum disease is the hat over or the, yeah. the little roof over yeah. both of them. Both of them okay. are would be classified as gum disease, okay. yes. Okay, that makes sense. Another question that I got is um, sometimes like in modern days, we look back at some dental tools and procedures from mm-hmm. 100, 200 years ago and we think, yikes, yeah. that's intense. Do you think that will be the case with anything that we use right now or anything that we do right now? I don't think so. I think the age of like ancient sort of crazy dentistry, I, I do think technology has put us into a position where that's sort of over. Okay. You know, once once things like Invisalign became popular, once, you know, surgeries became refined, you know, uh, dental materials have progressed to a level where they're like, they're obviously not perfect, but I don't think we're going to look on this area I don't think we're going to look on this era as barbaric because there have been so many trials to like show long-term effects of some of the more negative procedures and some of the more negative materials where everything now is, you know, very technologically advanced, whether it's in the field of orthodontics or in the field of just restorative dentistry, you know, the holy, not the holy grail, but like one of the big holy grails of dentistry has always been like, how do you replace a missing tooth? And, you know, there are tons of advances in implants, you know, screw, you know, a titanium screw is placed in the bone and replaces a tooth. And there are tons of advances in how to treat the bone to, like, make sure those are stable where somebody can maintain teeth for much longer than they used to. I mean, sure, 200 years in the future, they'll probably be so advanced that they'll think our era is, you know, dumb. But I don't think we're going to look at it the same way we see dentistry in, like, the early 1900s when they just flat out used cocaine as an anesthetic right. you know right. that that That's that was intense. the anesthetic was just like yeah we got we got cocaine you know <laughs> why, why why does everyone love coming to us you know what i mean like wow our waiting room is packed yeah. man no i mean there, there, if you if you google you could probably find some old ads that I are like i never knew that they used cocaine oh yeah that was the first dental anesthetic cocaine is an ideal dental anesthetic because not only does it help numb the area it has a property where it constricts the blood vessels. So when you constrict blood, so so a lot of it, modern anesthetics have epinephrine in them. Right. Uh, so the reason why that epinephrine is there is because that constricts the blood vessels so that the anesthetic doesn't dilute as much. You know, as soon as someone puts an anesthetic in, your body gets to work getting rid of it. Uh-huh. You know, your body sends, you know, plasma, blood to the area, whatever, to get rid of it. But if you put an epinephrine, it'll constrict the blood vessels so the anesthetic stays there longer. Does that make sense? Yes. Cocaine alone has both a numbing property and a constrictive property. So when they started injecting cocaine <laughs> into people's mouths, they were like, well, this is ideal. We don't really need anything else. This but the problem, problem is it's highly addictive. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so people were really on top of coming so to the dentist. Let's just say that as time has progressed, some of those procedures have been Axed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nixed, if That's you probably will. a good soundbite. Did you know cocaine was the original dental anesthetic? <laughs> That's probably be the, the best soundbite we get. That's probably the best soundbite we've got. I love that so much. That's crazy. When did they stop that? Do you know? Honestly, I have no idea, but... I, you know, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to bust out my phone right now. But no, like, that's okay. I'm that's sure, all right. I'm sure, I have my notes right I'm sure here. once you, like, do the edit this, you could do a little bit of Googling and you probably find, like, old ads that are like, we use 100% pure cocaine for your teeth. Cocaine for your health. You know what I mean? Like, that's, you know, times have changed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's freaking crazy. I was going to ask you a mother educational question, but my mind's, like, blown again. That's a pretty good one. That's a good little soundbite, <laughs> huh? I love that. What do you do you think Invisalign is just as 
with effective as braces? Yeah, I mean, Invisalign, I would say, is like 90% as effective as braces in most cases because okay. of so many advances in the way Invisalign's progressed. I like Invisalign. I don't have a problem with it. I'll tell you that the only problem I have with Invisalign is this. And, you know, we could... Right. Uh, the only problem I have with Invisalign is because it's seen as a more luxurious product. Uh-huh. Over time, I tend to get older patients looking for it. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they're adults. They don't want braces. They don't want to have a brace face. They just want Invisalign, right? And I know it's going to work. But the problem with Invisalign is because it's, you know, touted as a, a pure alternative to braces, if there's any one thing wrong with the case, it's a little tough to deal with. So, for instance, if somebody goes through eight months of Invisalign and there's one tooth that's not perfect, I sort of need to do a refinement. I need to send a mold back to Invisalign, they send me back more trays. And then we it's not like we start the process over, but now it's like a lot more work. Right. And 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 depending on the patient's needs, that can become very time consuming. Some people are very cool with the result they get from Invisalign, but if there are small tweaks, they're super easy to do with braces. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like if, if your tooth is half a millimeter off yeah. and you're the type of patient who's like really sort of cognizant of that and you're not happy with the Invisalign result, I can finish you with braces in three months. Does that make sense? Right. And the that's the only sort of issues, and it doesn't happen often, but I feel like in invis- it doesn't matter. I feel like if your case is like of a moderate difficulty, if you don't need any teeth taken out, I feel like Invisalign is good. But I feel like if your case, if I would call your case complex or difficult, then Invisalign is not a good option because it can't control the roots quite as well. Like it's, it's good. I'm never going to trash talk Invisalign. But braces allow for quicker refinements, you know, in the moment, sort of towards the end of treatment. And it does provide more control over the roots for more complicated cases. But also people lose their trays, especially teenagers. So with Invisalign, if you lose your trays, you know, you leave them at a friend's house or leave them on vacation, that's going to delay your treatment quite a bit. Whereas the braces are stuck on there, you know, like I'm controlling where the teeth move. All you have to do is like not eat chips for a while and it'll be okay. (laughs) Yeah. That's hard to give up chips for no, some I kids. No, know. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. You know, I, I do uh, – most of the time when patients break off braces, we just fix them, not even care. But if it becomes habitual, you know, we do have to talk to the parent and the patient. We're like, look, we want to finish you. We, we want to finish you. I know you like, you know, chips. I know you like hard candy. Right. But, but please stop. Like, this is a problem. And every once in a while, like, there will be conflict. Like, the kid will be like, I don't eat anything hard. And the parent will be like, I don't feed him anything hard. But then, like, a little sibling will rat him out. They'll be like, oh, will you chew on erasers or something, something that's not food. Oh. And they'll be like, well, it doesn't say on the list I can't chew erasers. I'm like, this well, is. That's not edible. You shouldn't uh, be chewing on erasers. You know, so 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 sometimes the job does feel like a like a little bit of, like, I got to play Sherlock Holmes. And I don't even, I don't want to. I don't be like, did you eat any, did you eat any, did you eat chips? No. Are you sure? Did you eat anything crunchy? No. Well, you've broken seven braces in the last four visits. Are you sure? And then I'll take the mom back. I'll be like, is there anything? It's like, well, he opens bottle caps with his teeth. I'm like, why? What? You know, it's not always, it's not always, but you know, most, most of the time we just, we just move on. Cause I don't, I don't want to give anybody any, if they don't have a big habit, I don't want to give them anxiety. I just fix it and call it a day. Yeah, so. It's like, it's crazy how that's not common sense of like, I can't figure out my braces are breaking. Well, well I'm not eating chips, but I'm tearing off bottle caps well, with my teeth. I think a lot of the kids, they just don't want to get in trouble. Like, you know, yeah, dealing with sense. adolescents, once they get above like 11 years old, they're aware of what a lie is. Yeah. They're aware that like, I have no way of proving or disproving anything they say. So they'll just say no. They'll be like, I have no idea how it happened. <laughs> and as long as they stick to their guns, they won't get in trouble. Like. You know, they're afraid their parents might yell at them. You know, like they're afraid I might get mad. And, you know, if you're honest, like, I, I don't care. The only times I've ever, you know, really sort of, you know, gotten upset is when it becomes like a super habitual thing and I have to talk to the parent, you know, and I'm like, look, like, I gain nothing from keeping this child in braces for too long. Just like, help me, like. Just help. help me. If it makes you feel any better, um, the kids will just lie to the teacher's face as well. Like they will yeah. literally throw something across the room, and you'll say, "Hey, just don't throw next time. Like that's not safe." I didn't throw anything. I just saw. I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. No, all it's... the time, 
all the time. It's a tough thing to deal with. And, <laughs> you know, but obviously in a school, I think they deal with it in a much different way because oh. they're in a crowd. You know, in the orthodontic office, they can't really hide in the crowd. You know, it's just them, you know, in the chair and the, me and the assistant. Well, um, a fun story. I actually know someone. That I, I, My friend in middle school, braces actually saved her teeth from Whoa. falling out because um, we did competitive cheerleading. Oh, wow. I know where this is going. She got hit. She got oh. kicked in the face, like kicked hard. And they told yeah. her that like uh, like her lip was all busted up. Like every it was a mess. It was really yeah, bad. Yeah. But they told her that if she didn't have her braces there, mm. that she probably would have lost teeth. That makes sense. Because yep. they not only kept them just right there, mm-hmm. but also that it protect or it also provided like a little bit of a barrier mm. of like Kind of like a little mini wall line of defense to the actual teeth. It does. Yeah, that does happen. I've seen Which that before. Crazy. I've seen people get hit and with braces on and the teeth sort of stayed in place. Yeah. That's so crazy. Do you think Do you think there are any other like misconceptions when it comes to orthodontics or dentists or anything like that? Like you were talking about earlier. How... I feel like I feel like mewing is something that needs to be addressed. Mewing. Like is mewing that? is a um, it's sort of popular on a lot of online communities okay. where by holding your tongue a certain way, you can sort of alter your profile. And a lot of the principles of mewing are, are very good. Like I've watched – so there's a there's a Dr. Mew who I believe is in London who's released a series of lectures, you uh-huh. know, where he talks about how it's, it's very easy to like alter someone's facial structure with tongue posture and preventing mouth breathing. And everything he says – is sort of right. You know, I have no problem with, you know, sort of the Mew philosophy. Because if you train a young person to, like, hold their tongue in a certain posture, I I do see it as something that can work. The problem with Mewing is that it's been sort of co-opted by, you know, certain online communities to be something that, like, you can change your entire face. It's called, (laughs) it's called looks maxing. And it's, there's no science behind it. It's, it's completely mind boggling, but because it exists, certain people sell products like things where you chew on like a rubber ball to increase the, the strength of your masseter muscle to like give yourself a snatched jawline. Is that line. not real? Oh, it's 100% not real. That's so sad. I bought one. Oh, and how'd it do? <laughs> I don't know. I, st- I, I didn't start it's using not, it yet. It's not actually going to help you because they're looking for this very sharp jawline. And even if, like for you to work the masseter enough to actually build up, first off, it's going to make your face look puffy. It's not going to give you the snatched jawline. Oh. People, there's there's a procedure where people Botox the masseter to make it smaller. And that gives you a more snatched jawline. Interesting. The whole idea that you need to like chew on a little rubber ball can screw with your TMJ. It's, it's potentially very, very destructive. But Dr. Mew never talks about that. But it's this, these online communities who look at mewing and they say, you, we don't need orthodontists. We can just do these things with our tongue. And the big problem is that a lot of these, you know, young men, they'll start mewing at the same time as they do a lot of exercise. <laughs> so, so there'll be a kid who's, you know, maybe can't get a lot of dates. They want to improve their appearance. So they, they get into these looks maxing forums and like they're certain they'll, they'll change their diet. They'll start working out and they'll be like, look at me. I started mewing and I, I went from this to this. And they'll show a picture of themselves at like 13, like slack jawed, <laughs> you know, like skinny. And then they'll show themselves at like 18, like buff, good looking, big jaw. And they're like, yeah, this is what mewing did. I'm like, buddy. That's what puberty did. Puberty did that. <laughs> Exercise did that. Weight loss did that. Like, it's so much more complicated. And and that's the issue. Like, people ask me, like, what do you think of Dr. Mew? I'm like, have you, if you watch his lectures, like, from an orthodontic standpoint, he's, all of, all of the stuff he says, like, makes sense. But, you know, he also goes into the element of, you know, prehistoric humans, you know, ate more grainy, like harder grainy foods. So we worked out our jaws more. And so that developed our jaws at a, at a completely different level. So, you know, if we emulate that in the new generations, we can sort of eliminate the need for traditional orthodontics. And what he says, like, there's merit to that, but it's very hard to do a controlled study. But even if we did worldwide do that, the problem is processed foods are so part of our society that like... To go back to like a primal diet it's is next it, to impossible. I'm saying it's it's you you could do it. You could raise your kid that way, but it's it's very very difficult to implement that because you know society's evolved in such a way that 
you know, even even if you could, the ability to do so may be extremely cost and effective, extremely time consuming for our modern day society. And this is, you know, maybe there's merit to saying like, oh, well, the older generations, you know, they they had like bigger jaws. They always look at these certain aboriginal skulls and they're like, well, look, it's because of their diet. It's because of their diet. There's, there's, you know, there's holes in those theories in some places, but if we assume that it's correct, then the adjustments we would need to make to grow our jaws now would have to be like up and down the food chain. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like we would need to go really hard in how we train our kids. And it's just... Even if it may be right, it's difficult to implement that. Right. But the, like I said, the problem is the problem isn't whether or not Dr. Mew is right or wrong. I like a lot of Dr. Mew's People philosophies. What he's saying. My problem is they take what he's saying and they're like, all orthodontists are criminals. We can fix everything with tongue posture and people will the people will come to me like there's certain things you cannot fix with tongue posture especially as an adult and the adults with the success stories nine times out of ten it's in conjunction with major lifestyle changes and they're like well no mewing did this i'm like no puberty and weight loss did that half of the guys get chin implants you know like there's i think uh, matt reif was a good example <laughs> you know where he you know, looked a certain way and then they're like oh no well you know i grew up i started working out and he's like looked at as a an example of how lifestyle changes can affect you but like it's arguable that he may or may not have had a chin implant right and when you you know when you're at a certain lifestyle like it's very easy to sort of lie to the audience and be like oh i just grew up this is how i look now because some people don't like to admit when they've received plastic surgery right and so body dysmorphia affects young men just as much absolutely and the sad part is is that like this body dysmorphia can be used to sell young men products and no matter how, and, there are, and people are always looking for an easier, cheaper way. You know, if I look at a kid with a, you know, I've had patients with severe mandibular retrognathia, you know, who are like 13, 14. And I'm like, look, you know, your jaw, like you, you're going to need surgery. And they're like, well, what if I mew? And I'm like, I mean, you could try it. You could try. I don't think it'll work, but you could try it. And they never experience like major results. I never say don't mew. Picking, putting your tongue in a certain position, like, uh, unless you're crazy, I don't think it's going to hurt you. But at the same time, I feel like the expectations have been weirdly misappropriated. Another thing with, you know, Mew is a lot of his success stories started in very young patients. Right. When you look at sort of his clinical history, you know, a lot of these these videos of like, oh, well, we prevented surgery in this patient. Like, yeah, yeah, you did. She's 10. You know what I mean? Whereas if you did the same thing to a 17-year-old, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't work. Same. Anyway, so if, if the Lux Maxers, the Mewing fans are watching this, like, you know, just know that Dr. Mew's stuff has a lot of merit. It's just that it gets misinterpreted and, right. you know, and, and is being used to sell young men products that don't work. So what, exp I need to see an example. Like, what do you mean by a different tongue placement? I mean, it's, it's basically if you mouth breathe. Right. You know, if you grow up at your, you know, early years mouth breathing, it alters the way your chin grows. And you will develop more uh, a thin. You will most likely develop like a thinner palate. You will most likely develop a weaker chin that's going you know further backwards. And um, by pushing, using your tongue to push the upper palate, it sort of trains your body to put the lower jaw in a better stable position. You know, so a lot of people don't need it. But if you see a child or you're raising a child that's like definitely mouth breathing and you're able to train them to mew, I do believe it will cause a significant result prepubescently. Like I've got a son right now and I like, you know, <laughs> if he's mouth breathing for too long, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold his chin <laughs> very gently like that, you know, while I'm holding him. Just it's, to train his body. I, 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 it's, just, it's just one of those things that like I do understand why it exists. But people um, are making it into something it's but, but, not. But they'll, you know, tons of viral videos. It'll be like a girl, you know, being like, they'll do one of these things. And oh. then they'll, you know, oh. suck in their chin and do like, yeah. you know, sort of modely things to make themselves look like a good. But that's like, that's super temporary. You know, anybody can sort of suck in their chin and hold their tongue to the roof of their yep. mouth and make themselves look good for a picture. But it doesn't cause your body to change no. shape. No. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't even know like mewing. Well, like I, it's so funny because on the teacher forums, I've seen references to it, but I never really understood what it was, and so I never looked into it. Like, 
I thought it was the kid finding more weird noises to make it No, class. no, no. Yeah, like, that, that's what it is. Fascinating. Do you think, are there any other misconceptions that you can think of when it comes to like orthodontics or even just like you doing your job? Like I know earlier we talked about, you know, that one parent just thought that you just wanted to stick it to them and wrote, even wrote the letter to the board. Like, do you think there's any there, mis- Yeah, they, they wrote a letter to the yeah. insurance and they, yeah. their goal was to, their goal, they, they thought that the new state wouldn't take right. them because the previous state was keeping right. the money. When a, when, whereas that wasn't true at all. The new state simply wasn't going to fix them because the kid didn't meet the right, requirements. Right, for sure, for sure. Um, like, do you think there are any other misconceptions that either parents or kids or whatever have about like your job, like what you do? Oh uh, no, I think I think I went over okay. sort of the biggest ones. Like that's okay. You know, fix the teeth. I mean, maybe I'll wake up this tonight and be like, oh, there's something I forgot. <laughs> no, it's okay. But as far as like answering curiosities about like the process of orthodontics, you know, I just think, I, I, I guess if I can touch on one last Absolutely. thing, it would be that some people don't understand the value of phase one treatment. Okay. So, so if you get, if your child who's like, you know, between seven and 10 has like a serious problem, it's a lot easier to fix earlier. Mm-hmm. Some people steer away from that because it does tend to be more expensive and time consuming. But, you know, getting a, a kid at least evaluated young is very good, like pre-10 years old at least, because there are situations we can identify early that we can advise earlier treatment and make the case a lot easier, okay. uh, particularly with impacted canines, which I have a lot of experience with, where, you know, there's, there's a, a canine, a tooth stuck in the bone that's like a little off. When the kid's 10 and like if we extract a few baby teeth, line things up, that tooth will sort of slide into place. But if it's not treated, it can get stuck there and require right. surgery, which is, you know, arguably more uncomfortable. Int- okay. So okay. I guess I guess this final answer is like, don't be afraid to see an orthodontist a little earlier. And if, if that orthodontist is sort of, you know, on the level, they'll be honest and tell you, you know, you can wait another year. Or tell you, hey, if we start now, we can make this situation a lot easier. Okay. I think that's perfect. And you might not have one for this next question. That's totally okay Get if me. not. Have you ever, other than that one lady that we just talked about, have you ever had anyone else, any kind of patient, parent, whatever, just really make your job way more harder than it needed to be that really just ever stuck in your brain? Um. Uh, I'm trying to think of like any situation that, you know, I'm trying to think of even if I were to say the story, how would I phrase it? That's okay. You know, even though it was, you know, eight years ago, like you never know. They'll be like, hey, were you talking <laughs> about me? <laughs> no, I totally you know, I can, get it. I can never say, I never want to like specifically seem like I'm calling anyone out because every, pa- every parent always sort of wants what's best for their right. kid. Right, right. And I feel like frustration from my part often comes in... Like, like, like orthodontics, you know, a lot of pa- patients walk away extremely happy. Right. Most you know? do. 100%. But at the end of the day, like, there's some some cases where expectations don't really meet the realistic elements of the goal. Okay. And sometimes that's very difficult for patients, parents to understand because they want me to fix, their child may have a problem that's way beyond just orthodontics, mm-hmm. like like major skeletal deformity or, you know, like issue with the palate where they had a cleft palate. Now the palate's all crazy. And my ability to fix it perfectly doesn't exist. And even if I explain it to them, I'll be like, look, I can do these, this and this and this, but your, your child will need surgery. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes the case will finish. And I'm like, this is as far as I can go. And they're like, can't you do more? And I'm like... No, they they need they need surgery. I'm sorry. Like this is physically impossible to get to go any further, and that's like a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Uh, for for you know, uh, it's I've come to the point in my experience where now if somebody's got like a major skeletal issue, I simply refer them to the hospital. I say, look, there are orthodontists and oral surgeons there. It's not close to this office, but I just don't like I don't like taking on like super heroic cases now. Where, you know, maybe I'll explain something to a mom. I'll be like, yo, this is a tough case. They're going to need surgery. They need surgery. You want to start? I can fix up this, this, and this. But I'm not going to be able to fix up everything else. And then, you know, like a a dad comes in the next time or like a year later and he's like, well, why can't you fix that? I'm like, well, the very first day I explained this. Mom signed a piece of paper. They need surgery. He's like, well, I didn't hear about surgery. And I'm like, what? 
Uh, you don't listen to the things I've said. I'm like, I'm, so, like, I'm not trying to finish the case in a compromised way, but we always knew it was going to be difficult. And so I think, I think without sort of like calling out right, any specific right. story, that those few times right. have been the only times where I've been unnecessarily stressed. Okay. Because it's no longer about the teeth. It's about a case that is way out of the scope of non-surgical orthodontics that I've decided to try and treat and the expectations versus the reality of it. You know, I, I'm, you know, specifically when somebody has like a major deformity, you know, right. and when we try to treat the case anyways, and, and even though the, the child can cannot eat solid food on their own, you know, like, you know, this particular situation I'm thinking, you know, I advised, I was like, look, they can't wear a retainer. This patient is too handicapped to take in and out a retainer without choking on it. Mm -hmm. So for me to keep these teeth in straight, I need to put a retainer, I need to put a wire in the front of the teeth. Because if I put a wire behind the teeth and it falls out, the patient might choke on it. You know, right. this person had a severe handicap. And so I finished the case and the smile looked a billion times better than it did. But like, you know, the parents like, can you take off that wire? And I'm like, I'm like I can, but like if I do, the teeth are going to go super right out of back. place. Yeah. I'm not comfortable. And the pa the patient's parent was like, can you put one behind? I'm like, yeah, but this this patient is nonverbal. Say it breaks. Say 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 it breaks. It could poke them. They could choke on it. Like you this would, is you wouldn't know. If I put a a permanent retainer in somebody of sound mind and it becomes loose, they can spit it out. But like, don't ask me to do this on like somebody with like a major physical handicap who isn't even able to talk. Yeah. So, yeah. Because so if something that's goes wrong, it. they can't advocate for themselves. It's, they don't know how to ask for help. Yeah, that's it's scary. super weird. So, I don't know. I think I gave enough information for you to no, sort of understand the context. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's so heartbreaking. Yeah. That's – and it's, it's so funny because, like, the one last story that someone else sent me, it's a much more – like, yours is so much more delicate and, like, understanding of why it's so difficult, whereas, mm. like, this story is just, like – a crazy person. Oh, what's the story? <laughs> um, so there was an orthodontist who obviously like had a 12 year old patient, mm. got braces, mm. and this kid was fooling around, like playing around in the house with their siblings. And f however it happened, who knows, kids be crazy, um, ran into the glass door. Like the pure glass door, I guess he thought it was open and just ran right into it. Happens, it. Yeah. Had braces, and so lips were all course, cut yeah. up, so damaged. Like he he was okay, and like his teeth were okay, but was definitely in a lot of pain. His mouth was a mess, and the mom said that it was the orthodontist's fault that the kid ran into the. Well, why are the bra Why are the braces so sharp? Did you make them this sharp? This is your fault. That's tough. You hurt my child and tried to sue the orthodontist for the braces that cutting into the kid. Yeah, that that's a risk. I mean, I'm sure the case got thrown out. Oh, yeah. Because it was oh, you, you nothing know, very came silly. Of it. Uh, I did have one sort of early-ish in my career. I did have one similar situation. Really? Um, where an oral surgeon removed the wrong tooth. <gasps> So it was a situ like it was a complex case, but I wanted a couple teeth extracted, and I wanted one tooth to be saved. Uh huh. And you know, all of my paperwork was 100% solid. I was like, take out these teeth, and then you know, this tooth, we're gonna try to rescue. And then when they came back, the tooth I wanted to rescue was extracted. And so I sat them down. I was like, hey, this is what happened. You know, I can fix up this case as much as possible, but you're gonna need an implant to replace the tooth. You know, like. Every, like I said, I can't like emphasize so enough can that I called the oral surgeon. I was like, you removed the you removed the tooth that I didn't want removed. Could you look at your pa paperwork? He looked at his paperwork and he's like, I'll call you back. And then like it ended up becoming a lawsuit. But they, they put my name on the lawsuit saying that I had conspired with the oral surgeon to not tell the parent that the tooth had been removed, even though that was my very first move. And, you know, it was dismissed with prejudice, which means they can't come after me again. Right. But it was still extremely. Off it was. It was like because they finished the treatment with me. That's right. The, they, That's so, so, so weird. So like, so like, I had the kid. I had treated him for like another year just to finish up the case as well as I could, and then they still like tried to to hit me 
for money. And and that made me feel like like very violated, very insulted. Yeah, icky. And I was like, look, like you knew you knew I didn't do anything wrong. All the paperwork's there. What well, I told you the first day I saw you, and I called. I, I referred you to a. I referred you to a specialist. Like that very day, where I knew there was a mistake on the oral surgeon's part, I referred them to a specialist to like give us options. Right. Like if I was conspiring, why would I have referred them to anyone to get options? I would have been like, yeah, everything's fine. We can handle it. So, so, you know, frivolous lawsuits are a thing. Um, it's thank thank God it's the only time I've ever had to deal with that but you know it, it's something that happens just like with this like weird braces cut up and cutting the lip situation like once people talk to a lawyer they 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 start to see dollar signs yeah and they may be convinced of something that's not true yeah because that's sort of how the lawyer is going to be able to like get them as much money as possible right and that it's sad it's it's, it's definitely an american it's definitely yeah. an american problem yeah yeah. Uh, because like the way we do litigation is way different than the way other countries yeah. do litigation. You know, it is what it is. Interesting. People just people can be the worst sometimes. They yeah. can be the best, but they can also be the worst. No, it's it's definitely not an ideal situation. Yeah. Do you have any last thoughts? Anything at all about teeth, orthodontics, hygiene, oral? Care? Actually, I have one last question. Sure. If you don't have, yeah. Um, what do you, so? This is more of, like, a personal thing for me. Mm. And, like, people who, like, really follow me know I've had a really weird medical year. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that I have something called perioral dermatitis. I'm basically allergic to fluoride. Perioral dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Um, Just just to be upfront with you, uh, I, I don't know enough no, about that's that okay. particular phrase that's okay. to I'm basically allergic to fluoride. That's so, interesting. Yeah, I would love to know what toothpaste recommendations you have. <laughs> I, I don't. I know there are a lot of like whole foodsy sort of non fluoride ones. Okay. Uh, I don't I know. I need to go check. I don't know any specifics to That's be honest okay. because I use you know just the standard toothpaste. Yeah, fluoride's uh, good for your teeth, but yeah, not your body. I, I'm okay. I'm personally okay with fluoride. I the fluoride debate is another is sort of a. Is it? It's that's that's conversation for I feel feel like that's a longer conversation to be okay. honest with you because, you know, there's there's ups and downs of like fluoride in the water. Uh -huh. um, you know, I do think that, you know, as, you know, dental education's progressed and dental hygiene and materials and water quality in general have progressed, I don't think fluoride in the water is as important as it was a hundred years ago. So it's you know, like put there on purpose. Uh, in in some in some counties, like fluoride is added to the water. Interesting. Uh, you know, this is a complex subject that, like I said, even I don't know enough about the current state. Oh, I don't of know anything to about it. Yeah. About. Um, but what what I will say is that, like, th I think there's a time in history that fluoride did do a lot more good in the general public water supply, whereas as water cleanup methods have changed and how dental sort of like dental hygiene has changed, I feel like it's not quite as important as it used to be. The pros might not outweigh the cons anymore, maybe? Kind of, yeah. Okay. You know, I'm not like a conspiracy theorist. I know. I, I don't know. Like the I don't know The fluoride is making the frogs gay. Yeah. You know, I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really aspire to that, but I will say that, you know, like it takes, I feel like change in public health happens way too slow. Yeah. When people sort of find out things or like yeah. science Agreed. changes, I feel like the impetus for, you know, our policymakers to like implement real change is just so annoyingly slow yeah. that that's, Agreed. you know, that's kind of like an American problem where we don't change anything even when we know it's wrong. Yeah. One, 100 percent. Yeah. And I, I also don't know enough about fluoride. Like I only learned recently when I was going into like yeah. diving in about like, what is that actually? mean that I have her older Yeah, I, ju like, I just haven't entered that debate in a while, so I'd have to probably refresh okay. myself on that's what's okay. new. I, I also, again, I know literally nothing until I started mm. diving into, like, what can I get that doesn't have fluoride? Sure. And obviously all these posts about fluoride is so bad, but I don't actually know what it does. Sure, yeah. In this, so I'm not going to pretend that I do. Got it. Okay, so now do you have any final thoughts, any last mm. things that you want to leave about Teeth, braces, mm -hmm. orthodontics, anything. If you uh, like my shirt, you can buy it at my wife's store, handsome.com. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I'll say. Um, I love that's that. That's so cute. That's such a like. Well, yeah, pretty cool, right? It's such a Barbie esque shirt, and I love it. Wow. Mm. I absolutely love that Looks shirt. Looks like a Prada. 
It does. Mm -hmm. And I love, we're both wearing pinkish mm -hmm. a little very, bit. Uh, very, very coordinated. Much. Okay. Well, thank you so much for cool. hanging out with me today. Yeah, good time. Um, maybe when I come back to LA in June, we can do like a real scumbag dad. Sure, yeah. And have more fun. Because I had, I had fun hanging out with you. Cool. Glad. I uh, hope you learned something. No, I really did. Yeah. I love, I'm like, as a, I'm a former teacher. I'm sure. a nerd. I love learning things. Yeah, cool. But thank you guys for yeah. hanging out with us today and see you next week. Bye, my lovelies. Oh.